All right, here we are working on trees. This is lecture 18. It's a continuation of trees. Having a good time here in the house. So we'll pick up here roughly where we left off. When we left off, we we're talking about removing nodes from a binary search tree. There's four different ways you can do this, depending on the, the children of the node that you're removing. The trivial case, of course, is if the node has no children, removal is just the node is gone. There's two easy cases when the node has either a left child or a right child. And as you delete the node, all you have to do is replace it with its child. But we're going to start today talking about the hard case, which is when the node has two children. So in this case, we need to find a way to replace the deleted node with some combination of both of them. We start here with this key observation that says everything in the left-hand side subtree is less than everything in the right-hand subtree, which makes sense because the node that we're removing has that same thing going on, right? So things to the left of the node that's being removed are always less than things to the right of the node being removed are not less than. So if you take that node out of play, then we're just looking at the two subtrees. Everything in the left subtree is less than everything in the right subtree. So what we're going to do is find something that will easily fix this hole in the tree as we delete this node. The easy way to do this, or one of the easy ways to do this, is with a, a node called the in-order successor. And it's called that, it's just really putting some words together. If we think about how our in-order traversal works, and then we think about the node that would come after the node we're deleting, we will call that the in-order successor. So the in-order successor is easy to find. We get there by going to the right one step, right? We're going for something larger than the node we're deleting. And then if we continue all the way to the left from there, that is going to be a node that has, at the very most, one child. Because if we can continue to go left, we will. Eventually, we get to the bottom leftmost side of the right-hand subtree, which is the smallest node larger than, or not less than, the node that we've just deleted. So if we replace the node that was deleted with the in-order successor, we can maintain our binary search treeness in the sense that everything from the right hand subtree is going to be greater than anything from the left hand subtree. It's easy enough to put that node up at the top without violating the binary search tree property. Plus, since it's the smallest item in the right hand subtree, it will always be not greater than anything in the right hand subtree. So it works out just fine. This is what it looks like visually. Right, so we start to remove this node V here as we take one step to the right and then continue all the way down as far as we can to the left. That gets us the smallest, larger item. We take that item and say this is the in-order successor. If I can replace that V with, oaths, with oaths, the oath value there, then you see how this item was smaller than everything here, but everything here is greater than that. So as I transplant this up to that location, then we can say that this item here must be larger than all of these things and not less than any of these things. So we have restored our binary search tree property. And the good part about it is when we have to delete this item, from where it belongs, when we delete the in-order successor from where it belongs, it can only have, at most, one child. The in-order successor cannot have a left child, because if it did, we would just continue to go left even further. So it could have a right subchild, a, a right subtree, but deleting that node from where it is with just one subtree, we already saw that's the easy case. All I have to do is replace that in-order successor with its right subtree if it has one. If it doesn't have one, right, there's no problem. So as we 
put the inner successor in place, we've taken the problem that we're trying to solve is how do we remove an item in a BST in the hard case? And the hard case is when there's two children. And I'm going to re remove this by replacing it with an item that I know has at most one child. Very easy. So this is a single function remove. This is a nifty piece of code that is recursive. If you pay attention here, you'll see that the function is named remove there in line two. If you jump down, just we peek ahead and see how things are working. We see in lines 10 and 12, remove calls remove. So obviously we've got some sort of recursive function. We've got some stuff that goes on in the middle. And then one more time here in line 33, you see a call to remove again. So this is a recursive function. And recursive functions never work unless we start with a base case. So let's get back to that. Recursively, as we're trying to remove some node, my base case is I've got nothing to remove. So I'm passing in this pointer that I want to delete the thing that it's pointing at. My base case shows up line 7 and 8. If that's a null pointer already, then we're done. There's base case, we're out. All right. Otherwise... <clears throat> we're going to use recursion here, right? If the value that I am trying to delete is less than the value that I'm looking at, right? Because the function has said, here's where we start. That's what tree is coming in. And this is the value that you're trying to delete. So here I say, if the thing I'm trying to delete is less than what I'm looking for, I need to go into my left subtree to remove that. Otherwise, if the thing that I'm looking at is less than what I'm trying to delete, I need to recurse into the right subtree. Those are the easy ones. The first portion of this function is getting to the node that needs to be deleted. We call this with the root of the tree with something that needs to be deleted. We can't delete it until we find it. So page one here, eventually through recursion, gets us to the thing that we want, right? We would stay on page one, recursing left, recursing right, recursing left, recursing right, until the value that we're looking for is not less than what we're looking at, and the value that we're looking at is not less than what we're looking for, i.e. we have found the thing we're looking for. That gets us into else. Now we're into actually removing an item. This page has the two simple cases, and we can see that uh, the two easy cases, I should say. This is when the node that we're removing, because we've recursed until tree is actually pointing at the node to be removed. Now, we say if tree left is null pointer, else if tree right is equal to null pointer. So this is the page where we're saying, I'm going to do the easy removal where I've only got one child. But hidden in that is also the fact that if I've got no children... The first branch there at line 15 takes care of that. So if the tree has no, if, if the tree node has no children, it's a leaf node, then its left node is null pointer. Perfect. And then we go right ahead and delete it there. But if it does have a null pointer on the left and a null pointer on the right, lines 16 and 17 handle both of those situations, right? Set tree equal to tree right and delete the node to delete. And we're in good shape there. So the node to delete is an additional pointer that we've set up here back on the first page, right? The node to delete is equal to what we got called in with. So this is kind of like our temp. So when we want to delete this later, we don't lose track of it because node to delete is still pointing at it. So here we are. We say node to delete is this thing, and I can keep tree by moving tree on. That's good. So this page handles the two easy cases and the trivial case. The last page is all about handling the hard case. You see we get into this else. We've already located the tree node itself, the node to be deleted, and we've got node to be deleted is pointing at the node to be deleted. Tree is also pointing at that. First thing I need to do is find the in-order successor. That's easy to do. As I mentioned, finding the inner successor, all we have to do is step once to the right, line 25, and then lines 27 and 28, keep going left as long as possible until I find a node with no left subtree. So that is the in-order successor. If I were to run through an in-order traversal, that node will be printed right after the node that is being deleted. So now that I've found this node, I'm going to take 
its value and put it up into the place where we're deleting this node from. So this isn't exactly like we've done our other tree stuff where we actually maintain perfect pointers. In this case, we're just doing this by value. So here I say I'm going to overwrite the node that's going to be deleted's value with the in-order successor's value. Now I've got two copies of the in-order successor in the tree, and the node that I wanted to delete is gone. It's gone logically. It's not gone physically. Physically, we're not going to remove the node. We're logically going to remove it, so that's how we've replaced the value. Now all we need to do is say that because I've got two copies of the in-order successor in there, I need to remove the in-order successor itself, which is where this last recursion in line 33 comes from and says, okay, remove the value that is the in-order successor. All right, that's single function remove. It's a good piece of code. It's good to look at code and, and pick up some style things from there. You can see how this is fairly complicated in terms of being recursive and handling so many different cases. But, you know, in just over 30 lines, it makes a lot of good sense with plenty of comments in there. So make sure you understand that. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty nice piece of code, like I said. So here's our summary on BSTs. We got each node pointing to two children at most, and in some odd situations, you may use a parent pointer. We don't have to do that often, because you look at that piece of code that we just looked at, as complicated as handling that delete was, with those multiple recursions and multiple paths through there, we were still able to do that without any need to point back to parent. And that's the majority of the way that trees work, is we're going to do stuff in them recursively, and if we plan ahead while we're recursing, we can do all of the things that we need to do without needing to point back to a parent. So usually we don't have that parent pointer. In the BST, we have all our nodes are ordered. Everything in the left is going to be less than the root, and everything to the right is going to be not less than the root, so greater than or equal to. We found out how to modify nodes. It's pretty easy when they're external. It's a little bit more complicated when they're internal, but we figured out uh, the the trivial case, the two easy cases, and the one hard case. In general, we like BSTs because they have this log n average case activity. Um, the worst case, however, is when we do have a stick tree. It is still a BST. It is still legal. But if I've got sort of the smallest node in the tree as the root, and then 10 successively larger growing nodes, it's going to be a a linear search essentially if I want to use that later on because I don't have anything other than this sort of like small node, bigger node, bigger node, bigger node, bigger node, bigger node. So if I've got something that looks like that, that's a legal valid BST, but in, that's a worst case BST. That's going to have me looking at a linear number of items to find what I need. So on average, when I've got some uh, some more tree feel to it. So I've got nodes that have two children and things like that. Then I've got log end behavior for most of my operations. <clears throat> Seem to have lost some slide here. Haven't seen this in a while. Sorry. Um, I seem to have lost some text on this slide. So, um, Tree height reviews, or is this just tree height? I don't know. We seem to have lost depth. Huh. All right. Let's just talk about tree height then. Height, of course, is defined recursively because our tree is defined recursively. Usually when I tab back and forth between slides, stuff that's hidden there shows up, but it's not coming back. So all I've got here is height. Height recursively defined is... Uh, not going to work unless I got, once again, a base case. Nothing recursive works without base cases. So I start out saying an empty tree, we call that height zero. After that, my recursive definition says that height of any node is the maximum of the height of its children plus one. There's height. Height is measured from the top down. Did I say that right? That's depth. That's measured from the top down. Height is measured from uh, the leaves up. That sounds wrong, so I had to stop there. All right, so we've got that covered. Now we're going to use this in this new thing. It's called an AVL tree. And an AVL tree is a BST. That's why it says start with a BST. An AVL tree is exactly a BST, but the operations that we use on it maintain this property that 
that we call the height balance property. And it's easily stated, it says for every internal node V in the tree, the heights of the children of V can differ by at most one. And then we use rotations to correct these imbalances. So what this does is, for our normal operations, insert and delete, our modifying operations. For our modifying operations, these rotations that correct these imbalances add a constant amount of work, possibly, to every insertion or deletion. But it protects us from ever running into a BST that has this worst case behavior. <clears throat> these rotations make sure that this will always be a log n height. So, first of all, let's talk about this height balance property, right? I said that it was every internal node of V, the heights of the children differ by at most one. So, here's some examples. Tree zero, of course, it's empty. It's hard to be out of balance when there's nothing there. So, we're going to go with that's fine. Tree one, there's a node there, but if we look at the heights of the internal nodes, oh wait, there's only a leaf node there. So, also, once again, nothing to deal with. Tree number two, we finally have a tree with an internal node. The root is an internal node. It has a child to the left, so its height of its left subtree is one. But since it's got an empty right subtree, the height of its right subtree is zero. And since those only differ by one, we can call that tree balanced. Tree number three, however, we've got two internal nodes. Starting from the bottom, because that's the easiest way to do this when I check my balance, I see that two is an internal node. It has an empty subtree to the left, and it has a right child of height one, a right subtree of height one. So then I can say two is a balanced node. However, five has a left subtree of height two and an empty subtree on the right, so it's of height zero. So I can say that the left subtree is height two, the right subtree is height zero, that's an unbalanced node. We need to keep those to differ by at most one. So in terms of AVL, I'd say yes, 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 and no. All right, excellent. Moving on, tree four. As I look at this, I can say any leaf node is balanced, right? That node is balanced because it has no children. It's perfect. This internal node, that's where we care. But since it's got a zero height left and a one height right, we say that's still balanced. Working my way up, leaf nodes, of course, are all okay. And then what do I think about the root? Well, the root has a height two over here and a height one over there. These two values differ by one. Then I'm going to call this balance. So overall, that's good stuff there. Now, don't confuse balance with completeness. It's okay if these are not complete. Look at tree five. It's not complete. It's not proper. But it's balanced. Right? Both two and seven are internal nodes. And they've got a blank child, so that keeps them at one and zero. And that's okay. And then as I look at the root node, it's got height two on the left, height two on the right. And that's just fine. So that one's good. Tree six now. Um, the easy way to do this, as we get into more complicated trees, I like to go with marking some stuff down here, right? And the first thing I do is, let's find the height of these items. Once I can look at the heights, then I can figure out balance fairly easily. So, leaf nodes always start out with a height of 1, so I can just fill that in. Then I look at the nodes above them, they've got a height of 2, and... Here I've got a height of what? Two is the largest child. That's got a height of three. And here we've got a height of four. So now that I've got all the four, I've got all my heights in there, I can go back in and build my balance factors. So balance factor, I'm going to do that in red here. I can go back and say the balance factor of any leaf node also is zero because it has no children. We really only care about the balance factor of internal nodes. 9 is an internal node. It's got a height of 1 on the left and an empty side or a height of 0 on the right. So I would say that the balance factor on this would be a plus 1. Right? Because the way that I measure my balance factor is I take the height of my left subtree and I subtract the height of my right subtree. So as I'm working on this node here, 9, I say the height of the left subtree is 1. 
and the height of the right subtree since it's empty is zero, one minus zero is a plus one. And I'll put the plus ones in there just because it's gonna be important we know this plus or negative. So as I look at that, that's fine. Moving up from my other external node, I can see here that this has got a negative one balance factor, right? That two has a left subtree size uh, height zero and a right subtree height one, zero minus one gives me a negative one balance factor. Great, so balance factors don't transfer up from one node to the next, it's heights that transfer up. So as I look at my next one, I see seven moving up. It's got a left subtree height zero, a right subtree of height two, so zero minus two gives me a negative two. So right here, this is where I'm out of balance. I can continue working my way up, and I see that five has a left subtree height two, a right subtree height one, that's got a negative one. So the root is balanced in this case. However, there is an imbalance somewhere in the tree. We're gonna have to fix that. All right, here's my proof setup. And this is gonna be one of my classic 281 style proofs. I'm gonna point at some good stuff and then wave some hands and move off. And, Save that hardcore proofing stuff for uh, 203. But a little bit of setup just so that you know, when I've got this AVL tree, I can say that I always have some balance, right? So when I've got, I'm sorry, what I say, when I've got a balanced tree, then I always have some idea of what my height looks like. So I'll start out with some definitions. H, height of the tree. N of H is the minimum number of nodes it takes to make a tree of height H. All right, that's the tricky part of pulling this off. The minimum number of nodes in a tree of height H, a balanced AVL tree of height H. That's really what I mean there. So N for zero, of course, the empty tree, there's zero nodes in a, a tree of height, eight, of height zero. And then a tree of height one is, of course, a, a tree with no internal nodes. So that's going to be balanced as well. But the only way I can get a tree of height one the minimum number of nodes I need to do that is one. We're good there. All right, so those are my two base cases because I'm going to move forward with this H minus one and H minus two because that's how it works. All right, so for H greater than one, when my height is greater than one, I can say that that tree is going to contain three things, a root node and then a tall side and a short side, right? That's a little bit hard to see there. So if I, my overall height is H, H minus one is a little bit shorter than that. H minus two is even shorter. So I can say that the root node is one value. That's a one. And then I've got the height of the tall side, N, the number of items, and N at H minus one, and the number of items at N at H minus two. So then I can say my base cases, n for 0 and 1 are this, and for nh, anything greater than 2 or, two or greater than, I end up with this formula, 1 plus n of h minus 1 plus n of h minus 2. Now we get into the fun proofy things. So I can take this and say the number of items in the tall side has to be greater than the number of items in the small side. That is a fact, because we know how height works. So then I can say that because n of h is equal to one plus the number of items in the tall side plus the number of items in the small side, I can say that n of h has to be more than two times the number of items in the short side, right? You can see that, because I've got one here plus this value which is greater than this value. So it has to be bigger than two of those. So I get this nifty induction step there that I can take as I keep moving on into larger and larger trees. And I end up with this closed form solution that looks like N of H has to be greater than two to the H over two minus one. Like I said, we're getting pretty mathy, pretty proofy here. We're stepping back. If you feel like you really need to understand this, you can delve deeper into induction proofs. But I just want to let you know that this stuff exists so we know that in the end, 
once we take the log of both sides here, I can say that h has got to be less than 2 times the log of n of h plus 2. We said all of that just to say that we know that this tree then has to be height is on the order of log n, no matter what. So that's why we like ABL trees. Like I said, if you want to go a little bit deeper into proofing things, we can do it. But it's not uh, the sort of thing that we're really worried about in terms of usage in 281. We want you to be able to use and understand an AVL tree. AVL trees actually don't get used a whole lot. There are other self-balancing binary trees that are a little bit more effective. But uh, um, the STL, for instance, is going to use a red-black tree, which is a more effective self-balancing binary search tree. But it is a much more complicated binary search tree. So we would spend probably another two or three lectures trying to explain uh, red-black trees and then have to give you an assignment on writing a red-black tree if you're going to get that. AVL trees cover most of what we need to understand about self-balancing binary search trees and why we would use them. So that's why we keep it simple here with AVL trees. So the AVL tree, all of the things that I do with an AVL tree are pretty similar to the BST. For search, since it is a BST, I just use BST search. I know that I've got the BST property. It holds everywhere. I look at a node. If the value I'm looking for is less than, I can go to the left. If the value I'm looking for is not is not less than, I can go to the right. So it works that way. Sort, same as a BST because it is a BST. Insert. Now what happens? I retain, because it's a BST, in my average case, I know that it's log n insert, but since I've got a self-balancing binary search tree, I know that it's always going to have average case complexity. So that's great. If I wanted to sort with an AVL tree, I can still perform an in-order traversal. It's still linear. That's perfect. How about this insert, though? Here's where I talked about earlier. We would have to do a, an additional constant amount of work to make sure that we retained our balance property, and we'll look at that now. So basically, when we're talking about an ABL tree insert, we're gonna start just inserting like a BST. Do the normal thing, we're gonna push it in, and then what happens after that, right? We'll start at the root, we go left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, until we find the place where this thing lands, and then we insert the value. Now, we can look back through the tree as we recurse our way back to the root, and figure out whether or not we're balanced. If we've disturbed our balance, then we're just gonna do a rotation, right? So we talked about computing the node's balance factor right here. There's my function for it. Uh, the balance of n is equal to the height of the left subtree minus the height of the right subtree. If I calculate that, I say, if the, both the subtrees are equal, that balance factor is zero, that's a balanced tree. If it's a plus one because the left side is taller by one or a minus one because the right is taller by one, both of those are also balanced. They're not equal, but it's still balanced. When it's out of balance is when that value is greater than a positive one or less than a negative one, like this nifty abs value expression tells us. If the balance, the absolute value of that balance is greater than one, then we say that that node is out of balance. So here's our balance factor example. And I already sort of uh, let the, the skills out of the bag on this one, right? So in terms of calculating the balance factor, I start by getting the height of each node. Height of a leaf node is always 1, so I usually just write those in there. Height of this internal node, 2, has got a height of 2. And then as I look at 5, I take the largest of its two children's heights, that's 2, add 1, and say its height is 3. So as I get all my heights in there, then it's easy to come back and write up my balance factors. My balance factor on any leaf node, again, is always zero because it's an external node. Then I look at this internal node two, it's a height zero on the left, height one on the right, so this is gonna be a negative one balance factor. This is going to be a plus one balance factor, right? Because it's got a height of two on the left and a height of one on the right. Two minus one gives me plus one. So I look at this tree on the left, I say this tree on the left is a balanced binary search tree. So this cal this qualifies as an AVL, right? Because no node has a balance factor greater than one or less than a negative one. That one's good. I would leave that alone. Over here on the right, I'm going to do the same thing. I get my leaf node heights 
and work my way up from there. That's a two, that's a three, and that's a four there. So now as I go back and fill in my balance factors, of course, zero on the leaf nodes. This has got a negative one because it's heavier to the right. This has got a negative two, a zero balance factor on the left, a positive two balance factor, uh, a, po a zero height on the left, a two height on the right. I'm going to end up with a negative two balance. So this node is out of balance. What about the root node? Well, the root node has a height left on the height, a three height three on the left, height one on the right. That's also going to be out of balance. That's a plus two. So in this particular situation would never be steady state in an AVL tree. Because I would never have the chance to leave it this way. That's how we keep things from getting too out of control is as soon as I make a modifying operation, I do a little bit of extra work if necessary to keep the thing balanced. Right? So here's my balance factor example. You can see now these values in what look like my nodes are not the values of the nodes themselves. Those are the balance factors of those nodes, right? So leaf node, of course, here, balance factor zero. This has got a negative one balance factor. That's got a negative two balance factor. Here, I see the same data, possibly, if I looked at the way these things would be sorted in a BST. And I say leaf node, of course, balance factor zero. Here, I've got a plus one because it's heavier on the left than it is on the right. And then this one's got the same negative two because it's empty on the left. And heavy on the right so there's what it looks like balance factor we should be able to deal with those right and like I said earlier when you're trying to figure it out the easy way once you get started is to just put your heights in you get your heights in then you can go back and calculate the balance factors from the numbers that you can see on the graph later on you'll get used to just looking at them and making a snap call on whether something is balanced or not but as you're practicing writing in heights and then calculating balance factors is the easy way to do it all right, here's where in class I say, let's take a break while you fill in the balance factors on each of these nodes. We're live now. I can give you a pause to do that. Why don't I do that? You've got something like this. Uh, I'm going to go back and check this chat transcript for about two minutes. What I want you to do is label a balance factor on each node. And like I mentioned, the easy way to do that is write in your heights first, then do the balance factors. After I check the transcript, a couple minutes, I'll come back and do the same thing. I give a little bit more tweak to volume. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to do this balance factor example, and I'm going to double back and clear up this uh, AVL height 2, height minus 1, minus 2 thing. So um, for starters, let's put in our heights, right? I always put my heights in on my leaf nodes first. That looks good. That's easy. Then I work my way up to the internal nodes. That's a 2. That's also a 2. There's a 3. And a four. All right. So now that I've got all my heights in, it's easy enough to go back and write in my balance factors just by doing the subtractions. External nodes, I don't even bother writing the balance factors and then they have to be balanced. So I'll just skip them from now on. As I move my way up to the internal nodes, I can see that I've got a balance factor here, negative one. Here's a balance factor of zero. 
Um, up here, I've got a balance factor of zero. This has got a balance factor of zero. And this has got a balance factor of plus one. That's great. This is a well-balanced tree. So this is a, a perfectly good place, a uh, perfectly good tree uh, format for this tree to end up in steady state in an AVL tree because it holds a BST property and there's nothing that's out of balance. All right, tooling back a bit to cover up this one question right here, talking about this, right? Um, sorry, I saw the question on there. So when I talk about this n of h, n of h is the minimum number of nodes in a tree of height h, right? So a minimum number of nodes, I would never have a tree with two subtrees that were the same height, right? Because if I was trying to get to a, something of height 2, that's not the minimum number of nodes to make a tree of height 2. That's one more than is needed. So that's good for a tree of height two. Same goes for a balanced tree of height three. It's going to look something like this. That's the minimum number of nodes. I could add more nodes in a tree of height three, but I don't need any more for a balanced tree of height three. So once I've got a tree of height greater than one, I can see that there's always going to be one side that's taller and one side that's shorter because I'm going for a minimum number of nodes. So if this is my H equals three, then the total number of items in there is 1 plus n of h minus 1, right, or n of 2, and then also n of h minus 2, or n of height 1. So there's where we come up with the fact that every minimum height tree has a root node, uh, sorry, Every minimum number of node trees for a particular height has one node that's the root, then it's got the tall side, and it's got the short side. Did that clear that up for you, Rajiv? I think you were, you were asking a question about that. I, I think that should clear that up, though, because one side has to have more when we're talking a minimum number of nodes, right? That's why this is underlined up here at the top, the minimum number of nodes, because I can always have more nodes but if I'm just getting the minimum, that's what the proof it uses that minimum leverage there. I can amp up my recording just a little bit more in the studio here. Uh, I'll put a couple more dB on there. How's that? Well, it's not that. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. doesn't seem like it'll clip too much. Okay. All right. So back to where we left off. We had just gotten this thing balance factored out, and we're good to go with that. How about insert? We're going to take this balanced tree from the previous slide. We knew it was balanced and insert 14. So to get there, we start at the root. It's less than that. We go right, greater, greater, greater. And that's where 14 ends up. It shows up right there. But if we were to do all that calculation again in terms of heights and balance factors, you would see that we've now got an unbalanced tree. And where is it unbalanced? right here at seven, right? You see that seven has a zero height left subtree and a two height right subtree. So I can see a negative two balance factor right there. And almost everything else is in balance. However, up at the top, I've also got a plus two balance factor. So it's unbalanced in two places. The good news is we generally don't have to work our way all the way up to the top. We fix our imbalances down below, and it usually solves the problem up above. So I've got two of these nodes out of balance, and I am going to say, how does this work, right? Well, I know that since I'm always balanced in steady state, then as I go to do an insert, I only need to check the things that are a result of my current insert. So as I've gone left, right, 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 and then inserted the 14, I just need to work my way from the 14 back up to the root. Everything else, everything else balance factor has to be just fine. So as I work my way back up, I see that if I could fix this, 
if I could just fix this area right here, the 7, 13, and 14, if I could make this balanced, how would I do that? Well, I might come into the 13 and go 7 over here and 14 over there. That's balanced. And if I were to put that here coming off of the 6, it actually fixes the entire tree. So that's going to be great. We'll see that in a bit, though. So first, let's talk about how we get that balance fixed, right? We're going to use these rotations. And in a rotation, we're always going to swap some node with its parent or vice versa. We swap some node with its child to fix my balance. We have to do this in a way, though, that preserves the BST property because this is going to be, in the end, always a BST. We want it to be balanced, but it has to always be a BST. So our rotation is this small local change. And this is what I, I alluded to earlier when I said it's a constant amount of additional work. I really only have to deal with three pointers and two nodes. And if I've got a, something that's out of balance, one rotation, which messes with three pointers and two nodes, will fix an imbalanced situation. Some, some rotations... Uh, re require, sorry, some imbalances require two rotations, but even with two rotations, what I'm looking at is no more than dealing with six different pointers, which could seem like a decent, decently sized number, but we're talking about trees that we really want to do some work with. We're talking about trees that have an N of hundreds or thousands of nodes, and so every time I insert a node, if I've got to do six pointers worth of work in the worst case, that's a constant amount of additional work. And what that gives me, however, is as I've got a, a number of nodes N that's going into the thousands, I do a constant amount of additional work, and then I never have to worry about dealing with a big O of thousands. I can always deal with a big O of log of thousands, and that's great. All right, so here's where rotations are. And this is going to be fun on the video, just like I do in live. I love reading this stuff super fast because it's really hard to understand. And reading it faster just makes it that much harder to understand. It all gets better once we talk about it, but just reading it, it's almost incomprehensible. We'll double back and then it'll make a whole lot of sense. For starters, we use these rotations. They're going to balance the tree. And they just interchange one parent with one of its children. And then we're going to do that, right? We're going to preserve the BST, but preserving the BST is tricky. So here's how we do that. Right rotation. We copy the right pointer of the left child to be the left pointer of the old parent. That's pretty fast. We'll get back to it. The left rotation, we copy the left pointer of the right child to be the right pointer of the old parent. Perfectly clear. I guess I could probably stop lecturing right now. But I'm going to stick with you, okay? The good news is this rotation is only this local change that involves three pointers and two nodes. I'll come back to this after we see it visually. It's almost useless to read it. Let's see it visually. So I've got two rotations here, right? Let's divide this screen in half. There's the right rotation on the left-hand side of the screen and the left rotation on the right-hand side of the screen. Great. So what I'm going to do in the right rotation is I'm going to swap the roles of the parent and the left child. So I'm kind of like... Wrote, it's called a rotation right there because I'm sort of making that happen. I'm going to take this left child and push it up, right? So it used to be the child of P. And when I said earlier, when I do a rotation, you're going to be exchanging the roles of two nodes. I'm going to take this child and make it the parent and take the parent and make it the child. So you see here after the rotation, now LC, which was previously the left child of P, is now the parent and P, which was used previously the parent, is going to be the right child. And that maintains our BST property there. So that's what's good about it is because I haven't really changed anything. Uh, if you look at the triangles versus the circles here, let's look at the triangles versus the circles. We've got a, let's call them for definition's sake, I've got a, a CLST, that's going to be the gray triangle. I've got the uh, CRST, that's magenta, and I've got PRST, we're going to call that purple. All right? So if I look at P, I say that everything to the right of P is greater than P. So everything in the purple triangle is greater than P. After the rotation, where do we find P? Down here to the right 
sorry, the purple triangle is down here to the right of P. So the binary search tree property is protected, right? The simple two are the outside two. How about gray? Well, gray was less than everything in the LC, right? Gray was the, the smaller left subtree of LC. So all of the gray items are less than LC. And if I look here, here's gray still less than LC. And BST is preserved. That's great. The challenging part, though, is that magenta triangle. If you look at it here, how do I get there? I go left from P, right from LC. After the rotation, I've changed the order of the, that statement, but I have not changed its truthiness, right? So I said, to get to magenta, I went left from P, right from LC. Now, if I go right from LC and left from P, I find the magenta triangle. So it is exactly where it should be in terms of binary search tree property, right? The values in the magenta triangle were all less than P because they were in P's left subtree originally. Now they're still in P's left subtree. That's good. And they were all greater than LC because they were originally in LC's right subtree. And so now, as I've put them in P's left subtree after the rotation, you can see that this is still perfectly binary search tree compatible with what we had before, except I've changed the role of LC and P. So we normally notate this with this RR around the node that's the parent. So this rotate right around P. So when it comes to exam time and you need to discuss what happens, you would write RRP. This is a r rotate right, right? Um, and uh, in this case, obviously, you're always going to be rotating right about a parent or rotating left about a parent. But when you're in a tree that has some other values, you would say, like, rotate right around uh, a value. Let's put a value in there, right? So this has got a four in there. I would say rotate right around four. So we'll see that in a bit, though. So here's my two rotations. There's a rotate right and a rotate left. That's it. And you see that it involves these two nodes, P and LC, and it involves these three pointers, right? Because there was a pointer coming in that points to P. After the rotation, that pointer is now pointing at LC. So there's one pointer modification, right? LC was previously pointing at CRST, but it's now pointing at P. That's our second pointer modification. And P, which was pointing here at LC, is now pointing to the left at C of RST. So there are my three pointer modifications and the two nodes that are involved. That's all it takes to do a, a rotation. You reorder those, you reorder those values. Uh, you don't reorder them, sorry. You reorganize the table in such a way that this is going to help us with our balance. So let's go back to our earlier exercise and remember what my balance factors here were I had something that looked like balance factor 0 balance factor negative 1 balance factor negative 2 those should be red all right so if I were to rotate left around a what happens there a goes down B's right child B, A's right child, comes up, right? So as I rotate left, it's got this feel on the table. So when I've got an, a negative imbalance, I'm going to rotate left. So I rotate left, and A and B switch roles now. In terms of A, which was a, a parent, is now a child. So I'll take B and say it was the child, and now it's the parent. So that's what it looks like after the rotation just those two nodes. And I didn't really have to mess with B's child. So B already had C as its right child, stays like that. Now what I have is those three nodes in a balanced tree. That's good. How about this next one? Well, if I remember my balance factors here, my balance factors were this was a zero, this was a plus one, and this was a negative two. So I'm unbalanced there at A. And my previous statement, which was, if I've got a negative balance factor, then I'm going to do a rotate left. And that's true. But let's try it from here. So if I start this as a simple rotate left, I'm going to end up with 
A going down and C coming up because I have to exchange the roles of two nodes, right? And in a rotate left, you're always going to promote the right child. All right. So this is what it's going to look like between those two nodes after the rotation. But C already had a left child, B. I have to put that back into the table and I have to protect the BST property. So where would B belong? Well, B, just as in real letters, is less than C, but bigger than A. So B should be right there. And if I perform just a simple rotate left around A, this is what I get. I do not get a balanced tree, right? I get another tree that's out of balance, right? And how is it out of balance? Well, this is a zero here. This is a negative one, and that's a positive two. So all I've done is traded one imbalance for another. So I will have to do that negative correction with a rotate left. But in the case of what we call a zigzag, right? I call it a zigzag because my balance factor goes from negative to positive. If I've got a sign change in my balance factor, then I have to do two rotations. I have to do two rotations, with the last one being the one that I expected, which is this rotate left. So in order for me to make this work, I'm going to clear up a little space here. In order for me to make this work, I've got to take this zigzag and say, I'm going to do two steps here. And the two steps that I'm going to do are first a rotate right around C, right? Because this is where my sign change kicks in. I've got a negative here and a positive. So with the sign change, I've got to do the lower thing, even though it's not unbalanced, right? If I look at C, C by itself is not an unbalanced tree. But if I rotate right around C, followed by a rotate left around A, then I get to a balanced tree, right? So we'll do this in two steps. My first one is a rotate right around C, which all I'm going to do is exchange C and B, and I end up with A, B, C. So this is what I get after rotate right around C. Then, without doing any other balance checks or anything, once I've, uh, when I first figure this out, I figure I've got an imbalance and it's a zigzag imbalance, then I figure out ahead of time, well, first I'm going to do a rotate right C, then I'm going to do a rotate right L, and then I can continue to see if I'm balanced or not. So I've done that first rotate right C. Now you can pretty much easily see that if I rotate left around A, right, this fixes because we had already done that over here on the right side of the screen. So the two rotations back to back end up with my tree that looks like B, A going down, and C going down over there. Does that make sense? That's good. All right, so there's rotations. When I've got no sign change, in this first example, negative 2, negative 1, 0. There's no sign change. I can fix that with run rotation. Even if this was a mirror image, if this was like positive 2, positive 1, 0, I could fix that with one rotation. But if I've got a zigzag where it goes negative 2, positive 1, or negative 1, positive 2, or sorry, let's say that better. <laughs> negative 2, positive 1, or if it goes positive 2, negative 1, then I've got a zigzag and it's going to cost me two rotations. But I never have to do more than two rotations to fix that thing. All right, so we just did this, this slide. We can skip forward. We see here that this is the one where I need two rotations when I've got this zigzag. I first rotate to look like that. It's more stick-like, and then I can balance things out. So I end up with my insert having these four cases. There's... Single rotations, double rotations, there's left rotations, right rotations. Combine that, two choices on two things, I end up with four cases. I can do a single left rotation and fix things. I can do a single right rotation and fix things. Or I can do a double rotation, which goes right, then left, or a double rotation, left, right. Sound good? It's pretty straightforward. This is just another set of diagrams. And this is the ones from CLRS. And I really like these because these are drawn to scale. The ones that we have that were uh, in color, those are not drawn to scale. This one, you can see, it is drawn to scale. 
So I've got these triangles that are the subtrees. And what that represents is, uh, in the previous colored ones, we were just talking about literally just these three nodes. Can I do it? But in reality, when we're working in trees in general, we never really know about the size of subtrees. So we have to assume that there is more than just one node there. So here you can see that the portion that I'm really focused on is these three nodes here, A, B, and C, because they're the ones that set up my imbalance. What I've got these, these subtrees, T0, T1, T2, T3, those are trees of some unknown height, but they are drawn to scale. So you can say that the height of T0 is the same as the height of T1 is the same as, as the height of T2. T3 seems to be a bit shorter, and you can see now the differential between the bottom of T0 and the bottom of T2, there's an imbalance there, right? Because this thing is too higher or too shorter than that thing is. So there is something unbalanced, and it's A, because A's left subtree is too less than the height of its right subtree. So I can do that rotation, and you see after A, the root, gets sent down to be the child, and B, the child gets pulled up to be the new root, I can see that A gets handed off, and you can also see how this little subtree trade happens, right? So this used to be B's left subtree, meaning it's always greater than the values in A, just happens to be less than the value in B. After the rotation, here it is again, still less than B, and still greater than A. So, since I was sending A down, and B was going to be putting A below it, A was going to be B's left child, B already had a left child, so we had to find something to do with that left child. We just swapped it over to A, and so it went from here as... Don't zoom. Back. Laser. Okay, it went from here as B's left subchild, we just swapped it over to be A's right subchild. And that protects our BST property, and you can see here now with my triangles drawn to scale, that no matter how many sub tree, how, how many items in these subtrees, this these T0s, T1s, they could, they could be thousands of nodes. We don't really know or care. But when it's drawn to scale, because it was balanced, it remains balanced, and protects the BST property. So this is just another way to look at this. Um, the other one, more colorful, it sort of looks at it in a simpler fashion. This takes it somewhere in the middle of a large tree. Got it? So there's my rotate right and rotate left, or rotate left and rotate right. You can see here uh, the business nodes A, B, and C are the ones that are sort of changing things around there. All right. This is what double rotations look like and why. So this, this is really helpful for understanding how the zigzag imbalance works out. Because if A is going to have a negative 2 balance factor with a positive 1 balance factor below it, it has to look something like this, right? With a zigzag here. And you can see that I can't just fix that with one rotation. After the first rotation right about C, it looks like this. In fact, it looks even worse, right? Because now I've got a, a total height distance of 3 from T0 to T3 all the way across there. But my double rotations are always done atomically, meaning I have to do the RR followed by the RL or the RL followed by the RR. So once I do this and I rotate left again around A, what happens? A goes down, B comes up, and I end up with this nicely balanced tree here all in scale. Does that look good? That's good. Here's my other double rotation, left first, then right. And yet another illustration of how these rotations work. This is good. We're going to make sure you get it. This one you can find on Wikipedia. This is just talking about tree rebalancing here. Same sort of thing, though. Now I've got some triangular subtrees. And these things are all drawn to scale as well. I've got some triangular subtrees, and you can see how um, when I've got my tree imbalance going left-left, I need to do a rotate right to fix it. When I've got my tree imbalance going right-right, I need a left rotation to fix it. If my tree imbalance goes left-right, 
I need to fix that by rotating right left. Or sorry, left right, left right. So it goes left right, I rotate left, and then I rotate right to fix it, right? Here my right left goes right left of my unbalance. I fix that by a right rotation followed by a left rotation and everything balances out. Right, and you can see the business portion of the nodes where we actually look at values. Here we've got uh, two, three, and five in the first case, three, five, and seven in the second case. I'm looking at five, three, and four, and three, five, and four. So those things all work out. The sub triangles, uh, subtree triangles A, B, C, and D, we think of them as all just perfectly good balanced binary search trees. All right. All right. Sounds great and all, but how do you do it? Check and balance here. This nifty little piece of pseudocode is how you're doing it. So the way that we manage this in general is every node now in an AVL tree needs to know what its height is. Right? Otherwise, we're going to have to do a lot of work every time, and it doesn't end up being a constant amount of work. So we've got a slightly increased memory footprint because now every node now needs to know also uh, its value, its two children, pointers, and its height. So when I'm going in as I insert, then I can update heights along the way. And on the way back, right, after the recursive call, if I update the height of the current node, and then I can check all of the nodes below it with this check and balance here. So if every node knows its height, I can say, well, let me check um, my balance and the balance factors below me. So you can see here, this check and balance is going to give me this. If I've got a balance that's out of balance, if balance at N is greater than plus one, which really, if it's greater than plus one, it's actually two. It can't be any worse because we do this every time we insert. And if we do this every time we insert and balance when it goes to two, it never gets above two. So here we're saying if it's greater than plus one, it really is two. If it's that, then I'm going to have to do this rotate right to fix it, right? A plus two imbalance always gets fixed with a rotate right. Just like if my balance is less than a negative one, it's of course a negative two. A negative imbalance is fixed with a rotate left. So that's there. Also in each one of those branches, you see there's an additional if statement that says, hey, wait a minute, if there's a zigzag going on, then I've got to do this rotate, this other rotation first. So here I've got a plus two imbalance. I'm going to rotate right. But if it's a plus two with a negative one below it, that's a zigzag, I've got to do the rotate left first, then do the rotate right. And then the mirror image of that is down below that in the else, right? So if I've got a, a balance at N is less than a negative one, it must be a negative two. So I'm going to rotate left to fix that. But if below that negative two is a positive one, greater than zero, the only thing greater than zero that's not a... 2 has got to be a 1. So here, if my right's balance is a 1, it's going from negative 2 to positive 1. I need to do two rotations, and that fixes it. All right. So, question on the bottom of this. What is the complexity of this? I already told you. This is a constant amount of additional work. You can see here, if both of the outer if and else ifs fails, nothing gets done. So it's zero amount of work. But... If either one of them uh, passes, and I end up inside either one of my major branches here, if I end up inside of either one of these, I've got, at the very least, a rotation to do. And we said a rotation was a manipulation of two nodes and three pointers. So that's a constant amount of work there, a constant amount of work there. If I have to do this other rotation, worst case, same thing. Two more nodes involved, three more pointers. So in the worst case, check and balance can run me through Six pointer modifications. That's a constant amount of work. Never more than six, sometimes less, sometimes zero, but never more than six. So I would say the complexity of check and balance is going to be a constant amount of addition, additional work, right? And then this question of how many fixes are needed after an insert, right? I think as you're working your way from the insertion point, right? Remember, we're going to work our way down to where we're inserting. Then as we check our balances and work our way back up, 
you have to work your way all the way back up to the root to make sure that uh, everything is balanced, or at least you have to work your way up until you're balanced, I should say. In the worst case, you don't have to work your way up past the root because there's nowhere to go past the root. So you may need to fix more than one rotation because of a, a, an insert there, but it will never be a linear number of fixes. All right. Outermost if. Yep. All right. Do we need a double rotation? Only if the signs disagree. All right. So here's the big exercise. This is perfect textbook exam practice. All right. I know you're listening now. I have your full attention. Questions like this come up on the exam all the time because at the end of the day, what do I need to know as your instructor? I need to know, do you know this stuff, right? You may know it, but I need to know that you know it. That's what tests is assessments. That's what they are. They're tools to let me know what you know. So you should be looking at this AVL tree stuff saying, yeah, this is really straightforward. I understand it. But then you should also be asking, what kind of questions might he ask me to prove that I understand it? Aha, uh -huh. that's where the trick is. So here is this thing. I say, well, take these values and insert them into an AVL tree and rebalance whenever necessary. Now, if you know how to do AVL tree mechanics, then you and I will come up with the same tree. If you don't know how to do AVL tree mechanics, you might come up with some other BST and it might be a valid BST. It may even be a balanced BST. But if you didn't do it the way we talked about, then you would have a different looking tree, right? And that's great. The next step then is like, how would they ask me a question that would prove I knew this? In one previous semester, I think we did do an actual, here's a list of nodes show me the final tree and you had to draw it up in a short answer section that's not a common question not saying that it won't happen again it could but much more common is we have multiple choice questions and you know that so how might i ask you a question about abl trees to see that you understood it so an example might be here is this list of nodes put them into an abl tree and rebalance when necessary and when you get done tell me what is the left child of six or another question that might work could be something like, how many left rotations did you do? Or how many rotations total were there? How many right rotations total? Hmm. Right? So if you understand ABL tree mechanics, you need to be able to show it. So this is great practice for that. And as you're working on studying, this is how you can think about studying for an exam. You say, what kind of questions might be asked to prove that I understand this. All right, so let's do some insertions, right? That's you, I mean, when I say let's, I mean you guys do it. Uh, so take these values and insert them into the tree. I'm gonna go get something to drink and I'll be back in two to three minutes. But take these values, rotate when necessary. Below the, below the values, you see here's this nifty little small version of the chart. This is how you do rotate rights. This is how you do rotate lefts and so on. So um, insert them and then in the end, we'll check to see what our trees look like.
All right. So this is where we start, right? We're going to start three, two, and one. What does that end up looking like? First three goes in. It's got a left child two, it's got a left child one. We find our first imbalance, right? So to rebalance this, I'm going to rotate right around three. So this is how you notate it. If you have to be asked on the exam what it should be, that's how you should write it up. Rotate right about the node that we're rotating about. And then I end up with something after that rotation where two goes up, three comes down, and two pulls up the one below it. And I get this tree right there. All right. So moving forward from there, what do I do next? I insert four, no problem. I insert five, problem, right? Now I've got an, a couple of imbalances, right? I've got a negative two imbalance here, and I've got a negative three imbalance there. Luckily, fixing the negative two imbalance is going to fix a negative three imbalance, and we'll be just fine. So once I get into this situation, what I'm going to do is what? I'm going to rotate left around three again. Looks like that. All right? Rotating left around three. What happens was three, which was a parent, goes down. And four, which was its child, comes up. We didn't have any other uh, things to deal with, so um, we didn't even have to manipulate all three pointers in this case. All right, so it looks like this after the, re the rebalance. What next? If I insert the six below this, that's just one note in. It's perfectly good BST, but I've got a imbalance here of a negative two. This is a negative one. This is also a negative one. So I can look at this and say this is a negative two where the thing is out of balance and the supporting node below it, this one here, where the imbalance comes from, that one also has a negative sign. So this is not a zigzag. I can still fix this with just one rotation. I'm going to fix this with a rotation left around two, right? So the two goes down and the four comes up. That's the major portion of the rotation. Four, of course, brings along with it five and six. But four, before it picked up two as its new left child, also already had a left child. So we're going to throw that over to be the right child of two, right? So that's where this three comes in. And two already had a, a left child. And so after my rotation, it's going to look like that. All right. Something seems to be... Is that good? No, it's good. All right. So my browser is misbehaving. Okay. Encoding overloaded. Hmm. We could be having some problems here. My browser has definitely given up on me. Um. Hmm. I feel like I can continue. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going. I, I'm hoping that this is recording here. It still says it's live. The clock is still ticking. Uh, I just got a weird little pause going on there. Somebody is out there. Just send me one chat. It's going to give me a chat from everyone. But somebody send me one so I can see that this thing is still responding.
Coding overloaded. Got some buffering going on. I think we're all right. I don't know, though. It's a local browser problem. Who knows? I'm going to push on. That's all I got. I know I'll stop it. Re restart it. Slide 89 if I got problems. All right. So inserting another node below this. Seven. That's all the remaining node here. I see that I've got an imbalance at five. Because five has a zero height left subtree and a two height right subtree, so that's a negative two balance. I need to rotate left around five to fix that. And once I do that, four comes off and hits six, five goes down, and then seven below that. Seven. Two, one, and three. You see that I've got a balanced tree. It's balanced, it's actually proper. And it's also complete. Ooh, great place to be. All right, after this, I can put 16, 15, and 14 in there. 16 goes in without any event. 15 comes in below that. And now I've got an unbalanced tree, and the imbalance first shows up at 7. It's got an imbalance of a negative 2, but the, the node below it's got a plus one unbalance. So there's my first zigzag. To fix this one, I'm going to have to do a double rotation. I'm going to rotate first right around the 16, then left around the 7. Right? So that's coming down looking like something like here's 6 with 5 below it. And if I do first a rotate right around 16, I end up with... 7 here, followed by 15, followed by 16. And then, since I'm going to do a rotate left around 7 after that, right away, I put the 15 here, I bring the 16 up, and then the 7 goes down there. All right? Yeah, that's pretty gross. But it looks like this. All right. Lastly, I just have to insert this 14 which I go right, right, left, right. Here's where 14 ends up. And I end up with a couple of imbalances. But uh, I think I'm going to fix it all when I fix this problem right here, right? Because I end up with a, a plus 2 imbalance at 15, a minus 1 imbalance at 7. And so I've got a zigzag there. So to fix this, I'm going to rotate left first around 7, followed by rotating right around 15 and we should be good. All right. That ends up looking like this. There we go. There's my well-balanced tree. All right. I promised you that I would double back to making some sense out of the really fast talk that I gave you. Right? And now I think we're ready to look at it. The second part is tricky. What is a right rotation? A right rotation where we copy the right pointer of the left child. Remember, in a right rotation, we're promoting the left child. But if the, the left child already has a right pointer, then we need to make the right pointer of the left child be the new left pointer of the old parent. Right? That's what's going on there. 
That's all we've done. And the same thing in the left rotation. We're going to copy in the left rotation. Remember what happens when we rotate left is like going that way. Right? So we're going to take some node, a right child, and put that above its parent. And put the parent as that node's new left child. But if that right child already had a left parent, or left a left child, that right child already had a left child, we have to give that left child to be the new right child of the old parent. And that's what those fast talks were all about. Much better now that we've practiced it. We've seen it uh, so many different and colorful ways. Um, but there we're good. All right. Let's wrap this up here. We're coming close to the end of it. I've got to do some remove. Right? We already did insertion. Removal. Just as in BST removal is about the same, right? I've got to do the exact same stuff that I would have to do in that earlier single function remove. That means if the node has no children, I just delete it. If the node has only one subtree, I replace the node with that subtree. And if the node has two subtrees, then I'm going to find the in order successor and replace the node with its in order successor and remove the in order successor because it's an easier node to remove. All right, so that's what I mean in step one, remove like a BST. Step two, just like an insert, I'm going to rearrange so that I can balance my height. It should be okay. Same observation as before. Everything in the left-hand side has to be less than everything in the right-hand side, less than or equal to now because we do some strange things once rotations start happening. Once rotations start happening, um, we don't always have that less than on the left and not less than on the right. We can get some things to go left and right after rotations. So this may rearrange when we've got duplicate values. It can do some strange things. But it still ends up being BST compliant in the sense that things to the left are less and so on. So um, what we're going to do in the AVL tree remove is just do the remove and then check and balance. All right. So here's my current situation. This is a balanced tree. It looks a little unbalanced, but it's not. Um, if you look at 44 has a left subtree height 2, right subtree height 3, so it's balanced. 17 is good in balance. 62 is good in balance. It's all good in balance. What happens when I want to remove 32? If I remove this node, I end up with a tree that looks like the one on the right. And there you see a real unbalance. Right? 44's left subtree height is 1, 44's right subtree height is 3. So that's a, a negative 2 imbalance, which we can easily fix. If you remember that this has got a negative 2 imbalance, I fix negative imbalances just by rotating left. So I would fix this with a rotate left around 44. All right? So as I rotate left around 44, I end up with this tree right here. And it looks a little bit sparser, but it's actually fully balanced. So the way that we do this is after we do a remove, so you see here in the, the, the notes up above, we're going to travel up the tree from the parent of the removed node to see because we can't really check the remove node, it's gone. All right, so we move up from there to see, hey, are we balanced or not? The first time we see an imbalance, we rotate as needed, and then if we work our way all the way up to the root and they don't have any unbalance, unbalanced nodes, then we quit. So I start here at W saying, well, I removed the child of W, but that's okay, W is still balanced, then I move up. See, well, now W's parent is not balanced, so I need to fix that there. So after the rotate left, I end up looking at the root, and I'm at the top. There's no more work to be done. How about this more complicated remove, right? Now I'm actually going to remove the root. So if I remove 62 here, I've got a bit more work to do. And just as before in our single function remove, I'm going to remove this 
by changing values, not by physically removing. I'm going to be logically removing it. So I start by saying to get this 62 out of here, I'm going to find the in-order successor, which is move left once and then move right, uh, sorry, move right once and then move left until I can't move any farther to the left. So here I am, 78 is the in-order successor of 62. So I'll overwrite 62 with 78. So now you see there's two copies of the in-order successor in the tree. Then I just need to fix that by removing the in-order successor node. And since the in-order successor node has at most one child, I can just promote this subtree up there and I end up with this as my final answer. Now, is that tree balanced? Oh, yes it is. We've got our fix in there and life is good. No, this is not good. Let's do our balance check, right? We see here that I've got a leaf node, leaf node, leaf node, leaf node. Those are all balanced. That's balanced. This is balanced. But what's going on here? I've got a left height of one, two, three. I've got a right height of one. So here I've got a plus two imbalance, right? I've got a plus two imbalance. So I'm going to have to fix that at the 78. But what's going on at 44? 44 has got a negative one balance factor. So there's my zigzag. You see that all of the, the height from 78's left is coming through here. So it's a zigzag. So I'm going to have to fix this with a double rotation. Uh, plus two at the 78 of minus one at the 44. So I'll rotate left around 44 followed by a rotate right around 78. There's my first rotation. My second rotation fixes things. All right, so there's AVLs. They're pretty straightforward. They're already BSTs. We just do a little bit of extra work on anything that modifies the structure of the table, i.e. insertions or removals. Do a little bit extra work to maintain this balance, and then all of my searches and all of my inserts maintain this lovely log n complexity. So BST, worst case insert or search is linear because I could end up with a stick tree. In AVL tree is worst case insert or search is now log n because I've got this height balance property that I protect with a little bit of extra memory. Every node now has to keep track of its height and a little bit of extra work, a constant amount of additional pointers that might need to be manipulated for every insertion or removal. Once I do that, I've got worst case insert or search both at log n, and that's great. All of my operations here are going to be log n on my BST, search, insert, remove, and sort, of course. If I'm going to do that. I'm going to be an n log n to build the tree. Got I got n items that are going to be inserted into a tree that's at worst log n height. So n times log n work, n log n to build the tree, and then a linear in order traversal. I combine those two, it still ends up looking like n log n. So I can use an AVL tree and then log n to sort this. Rotation, we call this a constant amount of additional work for a single rotation. We even say that even though it's twice as much work for a double rotation, it's still constant in the sense that if I've got a large n number of nodes, it doesn't matter how big n is. There's always three or six pointer manipulations to get this rotation stuff done. Useful website, Visual Algo is awesome. So it's really cool. Um, I say we go check it out. So here, this one talks about how to do the AVL tree. So I'm going to go to this BST page, but you have to make sure you're actually working in AVL if you want to watch this. So if you haven't seen Visual Algo yet, oh well boy, are we in for a treat. I think. Let's see how uh, browsers work here. Browser good. Browser good. So I've got a chance to mess around with BST, but if I take this selection right here and... Uh, no, not you. I want to make sure that I'm working on an AVL tree, right? So, uh, 
says near the top, I have to set this to be AVL tree mode. It does look like it's already in AVL tree mode. Am I missing something here? But let's great. Let's insert something here. Uh, let's insert the values 1 and 77. First, 1 goes over there. No, this is not an AVL tree. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. That's what I needed. AVL tree. Aha, sorry. Here's an AVL tree. So that, a, that, that last one you just saw was just me doing an, an insertion into a BST, which actually works. But here you can see rotations happen. So if I were to put in a value 1, um, that's going to be great. You can see the steps over here on the right. You see the illustration. We insert 1. We check the balance factor. Life is good. Nothing happens. The tree is now balanced. Let's try a new insert. Right? How about 65? Where does 65 go? To the right, to the right, to the left. Check our balance factor, working our way back up. Balance, 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 and we're good. Okay, so far so good. Insert 74. Where's 74 going to go? It's going to go right, then right, then right. And as we check and balance our way up, that's balanced. 71 is balanced. 50 is balanced. 15 is balanced. Life is good. So I need something that's really going to throw me an imbalance here. I can keep plucking these along if I want. Eventually, I'm going to get something that's going to throw my balance off. Go right, go right, go left, go left. Checking my balance factor. That's balanced. That's not balanced. Whoo, double rotation. Oh, I hope you didn't miss it. That's what it was. If you want to go back, you can use this little bar at the bottom to say, let me see that thing one more time. And... Do that insertion. Where'd it go? Insert 59. You can see I can step through each one of these steps. There's my first part of the single rotate, the double rotation. <clears throat> All right, so there's Visual Algo. So if you, if you need some help working your way through, AVL tree mechanics, this is great. You can take those values that we had in the slide, um, and if you want, you can say, let me create a tree, empty, and then I want to insert those values, which were, um, what were they? Uh, something like three, two, uh, three, two, one, comma, four, comma, five, comma, six, comma, seven, comma, 16, 15 and then 14, is that what it was? And go. You can slow this down. There's a little speed note on the lower left there. If you want these to go slower, you can pause it so you can see the steps in the algorithm. There's my first rotation left, about three. Shoop. You can see the orange highlighted links that are getting updated. Those are the pointers that are being modified as I check and balance my way back up. Seven comes in. I've got an imbalance at five. A couple of pointers. Boom. All's well. Here comes 15. That's going to cause us a zigzag. Rotate right about the 16, then left about the 6. We're good. Next up is the 14. That's going to cause my other zigzag. To fix this, I'm going to have to rotate left about 7 and right about 15. Send that backwards. Yeah, you got it. All right, so there's Visualgo. You can get some help from there and um, you can practice AVL stuff. All right, have a good one. Um, I'll uh, stop uh, streaming here and then just hop over to the, the chat itself and see if I can pick up some more on that chat window.
trying to stream again. I can just answer questions verbally here, if it is. If not, I'm going to have to do some more typing. Yeah, buffering. All right, I'm going to have to look at this encoder and see if I can't figure some of this stuff out, because it was going along pretty well, and then it started buffering. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, this is a little counterintuitive because a lot of things that deal with. Yeah, yeah. I, I pause it for a little bit, but then after I was answering questions, I think it's going to be either answer them verbally than it is to try to answer them uh, by typing. Okay. Did everybody get, did I get all the way to the visual algo site where I was doing the, the animated insertion? Did that stuff all come through? Just to get in a, a check on this here. All right, so let's look at this check and balance thing, right? As we go back to thinking about uh, check and balance, when we're doing an insertion, we always start from the root, no matter what. Your insert is a recursive call that starts from the root. So as you work your way down a particular path, let me find an example of tree here. Uh, work your way down a particular path. Uh, okay, I know exactly the slide I want to find. I just got to get there. There we go. This is our balance vector exercise. And you remember from here, then I said, what happens when we insert a 14? So you do this call to tree insert. It says tree insert from root down to 14. So as you're going forward, the height of 15 may change because you're inserting something below it. The heights of these nodes cannot change because you don't go into the right-hand subtree. So you don't have to worry about their change. Their heights never change. Then as I work my way from 15 down to the insertion point, the height of 6 may change. But the heights of 2, 3, and 4 to the left of 6 won't change because I'm going to go right to insert the 14. 7's height may change. 13's height may change. Right? If it didn't already have another child, that height would change. So now as I insert the 14, I say, well, your height is now 1 because every inserted node's height is always 1. And as I'm working my way back through the recursion, I say, well, now, since you have access to both your children, can you ask both of them their heights to figure out what your height should be? Oh, and by the way, you can also calculate your own balance factor and decide if you need to do anything. So that's how check and balance works, right? So as I recursed down to find my insertion point at 14, it's good, it's in, it doesn't need to do check and balance. It's a new node, is always balanced. And then the call that said insert below me says, well, at 13, my height was one because I used to be a leaf node. I was just a young leaf node. And then somebody gave me a child. All right, so since I can ask my child what its height is, it says its height is 1, and I can ask my other left subtree, well, that's empty, so that's 0, so I know my height has got to be the max of 0 and 1 plus 1, so now my height is 2, and by the way, my balance factor is the negative 1, because it's a 0 over here and a plus 1 over there, and I move back up from there, because after I was recursing down to get to the insertion point, I came through 7, and 7 says, well, now let me check my children's heights. Still empty over there, zero. This height now is two, so the max of that is three. My height is three. Oh, and by the way, my balance factor is a negative two. I'm the problem. So let's fix me by rotating left about me, and that fixes the problem. I continue to work my way back up to the top, though, because you have to work your way all the way back up to the root so that everyone gets their proper height, right? Although I suppose once you once you stop updating heights, you don't have to change it, right? So after I find that six has got a new height of seven's got a new height of three, and I need to do this rotation, then I do the rotation here, and it looks like um, it's going to end up looking something like this, with a thirteen here, a seven there, a fourteen there. And that's balanced, right? So now as I'm working my way back up to the top, I say, well, after the rotation, I guess I'm, I'm not going to be at a height 3. I'm just going to be at a height 2. 
and that seven, whose height was a three, since it got rotated down, now is going to be a height one, because you can figure that out during the rotation. Then I continue working my way up, because now that my height here is fixed, I'm balanced here, I know my height is two, the recursion says, okay, now check your height. My height previously was three, now I've got a left child of height two and a right child of height two, it's still three, so I'm good here. You probably can still recurse your way back up, nothing's changed, 15's height doesn't change, balance factor doesn't change and everything. Does that make some sense on, on how that works in terms of getting the, uh, the question I was getting into is updating the heights? I think I was a answering Rajiv's question if, if, if anyone else had that question as well, but um, did I get it for you, Rajiv? Oh, the question is, how does this not affect the check and balance complexity? Um, I, I think uh, for clarity's sake, check and balance was broken out into its own separate function, its own separate sort of pseudocode function. But in reality, it's just going to happen during the insertion, right? I'm not going to call a separate check and balance because then I've got to travel down there during the insertion if everyone's heights are always being updated that's when you're doing your check and balance working your way down right if everyone knows what their balance factor is and so on um you don't have to make additional calls to that stuff since any node can always access its children it can always check their balance factors. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it is. It's that crazy recursion thing. Since we never give up any pointers while recursing until we're absolutely sure we're done, until we're done with this insertion and everything's balanced below me, I'm not going to return from the recursive call to, you know, insert in my left subtree or insert in my right subtree or whatnot. And so it always gets fixed before uh, it gets left alone. There's the Eureka. We got some, some understanding. All right. What other questions are uh, asked for the outstanding questions? Are there any mediocre questions or any so-so questions? I'll take them all. The other thing that we can do, since everyone's trying to figure out how to uh, handle their quarantine boredom, is like you can always just code one of these bad boys up if you want to. You code up your own vector from that earlier um, capital A array class we did back in lectures three and four, and say make that thing so that it can do a pushback and have expansion, and try to figure out how then the distinction between resize and reserve really makes a difference for you. Um, the same sort of thing with trying to figure out how could I implement a BST. BSTs are really simple to implement. Then if you would say, well, how can I add this AVL tree-ness to it? And, you know, 
this doesn't have to be graded, but you could spend an hour on it, which you were probably just going to be doing watching YouTube vids or Snap or whatever. You just do a little bit extra coding. I got my kids downstairs coding. In what ways are red black trees better than this self-balancing tree? Um, I think red black trees are more efficient um, asymptotically. So they're uh, not asymptotically, I take that back. Uh, they're, they're, they're the same asymptotic complexity, but they end up faster. Um, they're just more complicated to get there. So in, in the way that it's better is that it, in execution time, it is faster. So that's why the STL prefers it over the AVL is because the red black tree is faster. Um, I think it's uh, roughly asymptotically the same complexity as the AVL tree because it's every time you do something, it's still a constant amount of additional work. It's just a smaller constant, which gets amortized over the life of the tree. So that smaller constant amortized over the life of the tree ends up making a red black tree a faster self balancing BST than the AVL, which is also a self balancing BST. So that's why red black trees are just faster. Other than that, it's still just BST. And they're drastically more complicated. I did not have a, a very nice... I guess my I can say my uh my data structures and algorithms class was not as kind to me as as we are being to you. They taught us red black trees and it was very painful and very confusing. And much like you will probably never fully implement your own AVL tree, I've never had to fully implement a red black tree myself either. And all I needed to really understand is that there's ways to do additional work to keep a tree balanced so that it retains the things that we love about a BST without costing too much to get there. And I think AVL tree is a great example of that. We could go much more complicated, but in the end, you wouldn't be smarter or better for it. So, I mean, you would learn a different thing. You could learn red black trees. That would be a different thing. It would be a lot more difficult exam questions. And I know everybody's looking for that during quarantine time. Like, how could I study for an even more complicated exam? I know. We'll add red black trees to the exam. No, we're not going to do that. So, uh, yeah, red black trees are there. Uh, it, it, it does make sense to go know about it, though. I'm, I'm being a little flippant about it, but it's good to understand these things exist. I would say one of the days that you're larking, spend 20 minutes on the red black tree page on Wikipedia. It's awesome. You'll get it. Your eyes may glaze over at some of the complexity and the challenges, but in the end, you'll have a, a different algorithmic approach that may in the future help you solve some other problem. So, um, I mean, not the full implementation of a red black tree, but just the approach to, as to why red black trees even work. You say, oh, I could use that somewhere else. So um, feel free to check that out. It's always a good thing to learn and see new stuff. All right, well, I think this is pretty good. We could go on another nine minutes of silence here. If you got another question, pop it out there. Um, if the stream gets closed before you get your question answered, just hit us up on Piazza. We'll make it happen. But uh, I think this is pretty good. Um, all right, have a good one. I'm signing off.